Okay, my friends, welcome everybody. Thank you so much for coming. We have so much to go through and so very little time. What time is it now? It's uh, 11.06, it looks like. So let's say 11.06, we're going to go to, we have 55 minutes to 12 o'clock, basically. 12.01 is when I'm going to endeavor to be done, but we'll see how that goes. We're going to go through a lot of stuff today, and I worry uh, that you are going to feel like you have to follow along with everything that we're going to do, and that is just not, that's just simply not the case. Instead, I would hope that you record that Git repository URL up there. Keep that repository link uh, for your own edification, for your own reference uh, for later on. We're going to go through a lot of stuff, but you don't have to keep it all uh, right now. It's just for later. It's a reference, right? The goal is to understand what is possible, not uh, how exactly to do it, and I'm sure you'll get most of that, but just in case, just understand the goals, right? I am happy to answer questions. If you have them, I'm always happy to engage. I love talking to the beautiful community, the, the beautiful uh, community that works in the, uh, in the ecosystem. So if you're out there and you have questions, comments, feedback, whatever, don't hesitate to reach out to me. I'm on Twitter. How many of you are on Twitter? Twitter. Twitter. 2017. <laughs> Twitter. All right, well, the rest of you, get on it. It's a great place to be. It's the new IRC. It's where all the development and the people that power the open source that powers your businesses are. So if you want to engage, find us on Twitter. We're happy to, to help out. What about email? Email. <laughs> email. 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 Anybody? No. Well, okay, that's a thing as well. And if you're, if you're there, I'm happy to engage there. It's not my favorite place to be, uh, but it's certainly an option, so don't hesitate. A little bit about me. My name is Josh Long. I'm a Spring developer advocate on the Spring team. I have been for the better part of the last seven years. Or sorry, almost eight years now. <coughs> I am an open source contributor. I am the number one top ranked, most visible, most prolific, most highly lauded, most acclaimed contributor uh, 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 of bugs, but still number one. Number one contributor of bugs to all these projects. Spring Boot, Spring Cloud, Spring Integration, Spring Batch, Bot, and Timely Activity. More bugs per commit than any other engineer on the team. Not, thank you, thank you, exactly. I, I, I should stress, I didn't fix them, I, I, I may have created them. Anyway, whatever, there's that. And I'm also a book author, I do uh, blogs and articles and whatever I can to help people find their way to Spring, so I've just finished up uh, the second edition of my videos, Building Microservices with Spring Boot Live Lessons, with my friend, the one, the only, the amazing, the inimitable Phil Webb, the co-founder of Spring Boot. I have just, I mean, like in the last week, I have just finished up uh, writing and editing Cloud Native Java, a book for O'Reilly uh, that will be published very soon. It's all about how to build applications that survive and thrive in the cloud. And for those of you who are wondering, and I can, I can see it in your eyes, I can see the curiosity welling up in your eyes, that bird, that bird is a blue-eared kingfisher. It's a bird, and this is particularly salient given our location and our proximity. This is a bird that is indigenous to the Indonesian Java Island. In English, we would say that it's native to the Java Island. And it's a bird, and birds, birds fly, often through the clouds. <laughs> so this is a bird that is native to Java. It's a bird that goes through the clouds and that is native to Java. It's a cloud-native Java bird. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. Anybody who knows anything about O'Reilly books knows that the most important thing is the animal on the cover. Nobody even cares what you write in the middle. It's just the cover animal. That's the most important part, seriously. We have, you know, we had the, like contract negotiations, who cares? We, we argued about the bird. So there's that, and uh, I work at Pivotal. And this artwork, by the way, is drawn by my teammate, the one, the only, the amazing Ashley McNamara. Uh, great artwork, I love this, I, I love the iconography. It feels like the, uh, the sort of pivotal logos and the open source projects that we care about, drawn as, you know, as drawn by the Simpsons. I think that's great. Now, these, uh, these are just some of the projects that we have at Pivotal, including uh, Cloud Foundry, Spring, of course, and uh, uh, Apache Tomcat, uh, RabbitMQ, lots of great stuff, right? All this great open source stuff. But let's be very clear. This is not the reason that anybody, any of us work at Pivotal. It's not the thing that we care most about. Instead, what we care about at Pivotal, more than anything else, the thing that helps us <coughs> spring out of bed in the morning is our ability to help customers and community members and organizations deliver value quickly and safely to production. To go through the workflow from concept or concept all the way to cash into production, basically, right? Profit. 
We want to see value realized in a production environment. We know that a lot of organizations want that as well. They struggle, though. They want to go faster. They want to be able to deliver software on the same sort of timelines as these sort of internet luminaries, the likes of Netflix and uh, you know, Twitter and Google and eBay and so on and, and uh, Uber. These companies that are delivering software faster and faster and faster, keeping themselves well ahead of the competition. They know that they need to go faster and they need to be able to capture that agility, but they struggle with exactly how. A lot of these organizations are very lucky. They have software that predates the modern era, the era of cloud computing and the economics of cloud computing. This software was written 10 years ago, more than 10 years ago. This software is a great problem to have. It's software that has represented value for their organization, that has served them well. But now, today, because it is so large and so successful, it requires a lot of people to make any changes. It takes a lot of people to move the proverbial Titanic. So these organizations struggle. They know that they need to go faster, but they have these large, successful, let's be clear, applications. But now that large S, that, that girth, is making it hard for them to be able to evolve the application, to change the application, and to compete in an ever dynamic, ever accelerating marketplace. So they look for ways to decompose that application. They realize that the secret to agility lays in how you deliver the software, how quickly you can deliver the software. Even Google and Twitter and you know, all these other companies, they are large companies, but they still deliver software as though they're very small. And the way they do this is they've decomposed their large applications, these large, giant, monolithic, monolithic applications. They've decomposed them into smaller batches, smaller chunks, smaller batches of work that require less people to make any changes, to see any changes reflected in the output. Smaller batches of work that in, in, smaller groups of people can work on to sort of devise features, to deliver the features, to test them, to reason about the impact of those features. This decomposition is important. And the question, of course, is how do you do that? Well, Eric Evans wrote about domain-driven design in his amazing book. He talks about this idea of a bounded context. A bounded context is a part of the domain model that stands unto itself, internally consistent. It's reusable. It doesn't require any other dependency in order to do its job. If you can identify in a bounded context, if you can identify bounded contexts in your application, parts of the domain that can be extracted from the rest, and that can stand by themselves, then you have a natural place to cut or decompose the application, to break it into smaller pieces. This can be a service. We call this a microservice. A microservice is an organizational hack. It's optimizing your organization so that you can, as a team, deliver software without the constant cost of synchronization across team members. It reduces the cost of synchronization. Because now, each individual team can focus on just their thing and stay in their own proverbial swim lane. It allows them to go faster. We call this a reverse Conway maneuver. Named, of course, for Mel Conway. In the 1970s, he said that he realized that software is a mirror image of the organization that builds it. If you have a crap organization, you'll necessarily have crap software. The trick, then, is to not have a crap organization. This is what microservices are. And they give us benefits, but they, they have costs as well. There are two big pains. I call these the hemorrhoids. You know what a, a hemorrhoid is, my friends? A hemorrhoid is a real pain in the <coughs> The first hemorrhoid of microservices is how quickly from 0 to 60 or 0 to whatever, 120 kilometers per hour, how quickly can you build a production-worthy service? How quickly can you build a service that is worthy of being in your production environment? And all that that implies. DNS, load balancing, heartbeat detection, security, observability, monitoring, all of that stuff. It's a very, very high cost. If you can't do that, then you won't bother. It will, it'll be too prohibitive and too expensive. So you'll just put everything inside of a giant big ball of mud monolith. You need to make the cost of standing up a new service as cheap as possible. For operational concerns, things like, observ things like DNS, DNS you know, uh, scale out, all that kind of stuff, I recommend something like Cloud Foundry, a cloud platform that's optimized for managing applications at scale. For application concerns like security and monitoring, I, I recommend something like Spring Boot. It makes it simple to get past those sort of checkbox requirements. Most organizations, and, and again, most organizations, not yours, surely not yours, but most organizations that I've been to have the dreaded wiki page. The wiki page with 500 easy steps to production. That wiki page is the enemy of velocity is all the things that you must do to deliver working software. So you have to get past all that. That's the first hemorrhoid. The second hemorrhoid is, once you've done this, once you've built a distributed system where things are talking to each other over the network, across potential network partitions, 
You've now introduced the complexity of building a distributed system into your life. And you need to get past that as well. So that's what we're going to focus on today is this second hemorrhoid. I'm hoping that some of you have familiarity with Spring Boot, uh, but I'm not sure. And we'll go through it ever so briefly today. Uh, but that said, you can find a number of talks. Look for my beautiful applications talk with my name. So what we're going to do is we're going to build a new application here at start.spring.io. This is my second favorite place on the internet. Can anybody tell me what my first favorite place is? Thank you. My first favorite place on the internet is production. I love production. You should love production. You should go as early and often as possible. Bring the kids. Bring the family. It's the happiest place on earth. It's better than Disneyland. I love production and so should you. But if you're not already in production, then you can begin your journey here at start.spring.io. Bookmark it. Keep it close to your heart. Keep it under your pillow. If you want for inspiration in the early morning before your cup of tea or coffee, start that spring that I owe. If your children are restless and can't sleep, start that spring that I owe. And if you suffer from indigestion after a long night of alcohol abuse and PHP, start that spring that I owe. So what we're going to do today is we're going to build a very simple application. I don't want to sing, spend too much time on the application. What I want is to manage an application that manages, uh, I want to build an application that manages entities of type reservation. So we're going to use H2, which is an in-memory embedded uh, SQL database. It's in-memory and it's embedded, so it's going to lose all of its data on every single restart. Very similar in this way to MongoDB. It just loses the data all the time for no reason at all, right? Very, very similar. Uh, we're going to use JPA, the Java Persist Persistence API, because I make poor life decisions. We use the config client for centralized configuration. We'll use Eureka for service registration and discovery. Zipkin for distributed tracing. We're going to use uh, the REST repository support as well, and the web support, and actuator for operational concerns. Now, I think that ought to do it. That'll give us enough. But I encourage you, at your own leisure, to peruse this list at your own uh, time and find out all these other options. Lots of great choices, and I encourage you to make them when you can. I want to briefly, ever so briefly, take a moment to look at these last three, or last two drop downs, right? These two drop downs are what I like to think of as non choices. These are choices that you could make, but that you should not. These are choices in the same way, <laughs> these are choices in the same way that stripping naked and running in traffic is a choice. <laughs> you could, but, but don't. These are what I think of as non-choices. And that's not just Indian bread, my friends. So the first choice, of course, is what version of the JVM would you like to use? Well, of course, in 2017, there is no choice. Both 1.6 and 1.7 are end of life, expired, past their prime, no longer supported, not available except for security updates, and even then, only if Oracle is nice and generous. So no. No choice at all, really. The next choice is packaging. A lot of people get confused by this. If by some freak fluke of physics, some terrible accident of time space, you find yourself somehow transported to the distant, distant past, far, 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 far beyond modern help, then choose dot war. <laughs> but if you're here in 2017 in Singapore, with me today, then choose dot jar. This is a big part of my overarching guiding personal philosophy of make jar, not war. <laughs> so I'm going to hit generate, and I'll, give, I'll be given a new zip file here. I'm going to go to my, uh, my downloads directory here, and I've got the new zip file. I'm going to say unzip reservation service, CD reservation service, and I'll open up my, my uh, build file there. Okay? And uh, we're, gonna, we're not going to spend too long building this application. What I want to do is I want to build an application that manages entities of type reservation. It's just an entity that we're going to store in the database. And we don't really care all that much about the entity. We, what we want to talk about are the sort of supporting uh, concerns. Now, I'm using IntelliJ. It doesn't matter what IDE you're using. How many of you are using IntelliJ? I'm just curious. Good stuff. Hot sauce. Well done. What about uh, Eclipse? How many of you are using an Eclipse variant? Very cool. Uh, what about NetBeans? Who's using a NetBeans? NetBeans? Anybody? OK, well, it's still awesome as well. What about Emacs? Are you here, sir? Emacs guy? Where is the Emacs guy? Every single country, city, and continent that I go to, 
there's one guy, and it's the same human. <laughs> it's the same guy. Same object identity. I say, who uses Emacs? I do. And then he leaves. <laughs> Presumably to go to the next conference to troll again. <laughs> Whatever. So let's see, my friends. Can you see that font? Let's make this a little larger, huh? Font more bigger. OK. There we are. So what we're going to do is we're going to have a, an entity that manages type, types called reservation. And I'm going to make this a uh, entity here. I want to make short work of generating getters and setters and all that stuff. So I'm going to use the Java compile time annotation processor called Lombok, right? which is also an interesting word in this part of the world, isn't it? So we're going to say we're going to have an ID called private long ID. It's going to be an at ID. I'll we'll say it's going to be a generated value. Uh, generated value. There we are. I'm going to have a string here called reservation name. And that's the entity. And I could generate getters and setters and all that stuff. But instead, I'm just going to use uh, Lumbach to do all that work for me at compile time. So these won't be kept around at runtime. And the result is that now, when I go to my code, I can say reservation r, reservation dot, get reservation name, hash code, set ID, set reservation name, et cetera. All that comes for free by those annotations. And what I want to do is I want to save instances of this record type into the database. I want to say that I want to persist records using the Spring Data JPA repository support. And this is an interface. I don't have to implement the interface or do anything uh, in particular to support it. All I need to do is to provide this interface definition, and I get support for finding, saving, flushing, deleting, find by ID, all that kind of stuff, right? And what I want to do is I want to turn this into uh, data. I want to use that now to write data to the, uh, to the database. So I'll say sample data CLR implements command line runner. OK, and what we're going to do is we're going to create a bean that just writes some records to the database, at component. And we're going to use the repository here, private final reservation repository. And uh, I'm going to tell Spring to inject this as a collaborating object in the constructor. And I can then use that now to write some data to the record, write some records to the database, right? So my name is Josh. It's nice to meet you. I've got my buddy Weirin in the front there. I've got my friend Jade as well. Uh, I've got um, Michael, Mikkel, uh, who invited me. Very good. I've got Emmanuel. I've got uh, Guillaume. Oh, my. Kristen. OK. Chris, there we are. Sorry. And we need one more. Who wants to be my guinea pig? I mean, my friend. Don't all, don't all raise your hands at once now. What is it? How do you spell it, my friend? V E J. P E J. Like that? Man. Like that? Nice to meet you. Very good. So all of us, we're going to write these records to the database. We're going to say new. We're going to save each record to the database, and then we're just going to confirm that everything's working by getting the response and then iterating over each record using a, a new technique that is only possible in the most modern of modern languages, the most modern and progressive of languages, languages like C, COBOL, Smalltalk, Lisp, Perl, etc. I'm using a method reference, right? So a nice feature for the last 50. 60 years that in Java we just got two years ago. So there's that. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to run this code. And uh, we should see it run. It's going to start up, and it's going to try and do its work. It's going to, uh, well, I just compiled it. That's not what I wanted. Control. Mm -hmm. uh -uh. There we are. So it's going to start up. It's going to print everything to the, to the database. And record that and reflect that in the console there. Uh, and of course, this, isn't, this is nice, but it's not nearly enough. right? There we are. There, there's our names. But we need a REST API. So let's build one. We're going to say at repository REST resource. And then we'll just restart the code again, uh, this time, with our Spring Data interface. And I could use Spring MVC here, but Spring Data makes it easy to build that API for us out of the box. So localhost 8080 forward slash reservations. Hello. There we are. There's our REST API. There's all the things that we care about. And I can do you know, put, post, get, delete. I've got hypermedia. These are links that support self-discovery or you know, client-side client uh, uh, auto-detection of, of APIs and REST endpoints. It has stateful information as well. Uh, and this is a part of a design pattern, HADEOS, H-A-T-E-O-A-S. -E hypermedia as the engine of application state. It's the idea that every REST in resource has enough information for the client to further manipulate that resource without any a priori or upfront knowledge. Now, each of these payloads is an envelope. It's called a resource. This is a resource object. It has a payload of type reservation and has a collection of links. So am I done? Of course not, right? I, I've got a nice API, but 
there are still concerns that I need to care about, right? I need to make, make it that it's observable. I need to be able to see what the application is doing and to be able to use that information if there's an incident, if there's some demand for an incident response, right? If something goes wrong, it doesn't matter what company you talk to in Silicon Valley, all of them have basically the same response procedures, and it's all human-driven. Human beings need to see information, present status information, and use that to be able to make decisions and go forward, right? So I have now my endpoint here, and I'm going to uh, use that, use all this information, to visualize what's happening. I can go to metrics, for example, to see the current state, the metrics, the heap, the uptime, the class is loaded. I can go to ENV that shows me the environment of the application. I can go to health, and this shows me the uh, sort of things in my application that could fail, the dependencies like my file system, my data source, etc. So this gives me a lot of insight into the, what the application is doing and supports a smart response, right, if something goes wrong. This is provided by the actuator framework, and this is inspired by other companies like Google. Google says it doesn't matter what the nature of their service is, it doesn't matter if it's big data, machine learning, artificial intelligence, batch, web, whatever, they have standardized HTTP endpoints that their centralized monitoring infrastructure can use to corral all that into a single place of, in time, right? It supports, uh, it supports that ever important single pane of glass, that dashboard, and we need that in building a distributed system, right? So this is certainly very nice, but I want to change things about the application. I can, I can show you that I can change certain things here in the properties. I can say server.port equals 8010, for example, and then we start, and it'll start up on port 8010, and that's certainly a good start, but it has a few limitations, doesn't it? It has a few limitations because it's limited to uh, the, the file itself in the, pro in, the, in the application. If I'm going to change the port when I move the binary from one application to another, I don't want to have to do that. I don't want to have to, to uh, recompile the jar. So instead, what I can do is I can kill this code here, and I can say maven minus d skip tests YOLO clean install. Okay, and we go to the target directory, and there we are. There's my my so-called fat jar, or uh, you know my uh, self-contained jar, and it's got everything I need there to run it. It's 51 megs. I can put that in an email, I can send it to my dear grandpa, grandma and grandpa. They're very smart, but they're not super computer literate. They can still run this. They have applets, right? So that's all you need. So if, op if your operations teams have trouble deploying this, if they need WebSphere, tell them to call my grandma. She's very smart and she has cookies. She'll help them to get to production faster, right? Java minus jar reservationservice.jar, there's my application. But I want to be able to change the configuration, like I said. So I, instead I could say, I could say, minus D, server.port equals 8020. And this will override the configuration in the property file. Now, this is a good start, I think, certainly a good start, but it falls short of four use cases. What if I want to reload the configuration while the service is running? What if I want to keep all the configuration in one place? How do I support secure encrypted passwords and property locators, things like that? I don't want that in the file system laying around unencrypted, do I? And then finally, how do I support auditing and journaling? How do I see who changed what and when, and if necessary, to roll that configuration back? For this and more, while this is a good start, it's not enough, is it? So what we need to do is to, uh, to use something a bit more sophisticated. We're going to use the Spring Cloud Config Server, right? So here's the, the uh, Spring Cloud Config Server. Come on. Wi-Fi, there we are. So we're going to use the Spring Cloud Config Server. We're just going to build a new one. We're going to say Config Service, Config Server. I'm going to build that, and that'll give us a zip file. Downloads, unzip, Config Server, CD Config Service, idea, palm.xml. Ah, oh, did you hear that? That was amazing. I just cracked my neck, and it felt so good. So here we go, application.properties. This Config Server is a microservice. It's going to manage our configuration. It's going to manage a configuration directory. And so we're going to tell it to start up on port 8888. It's going to manage a directory that we give it. So we have to tell it where to find the configuration directory. And the directory is going to be based on Git. You have lots of options today in 2017 for reliable version control of your directory. You can use Git. Git is also a nice option. I've heard good things also about Git. You can use that as well. Lots of, lots of great choices here. Just Git or Git <laughs> or Git, right? Um, so I encourage you to take a look at one of these fabulous technologies. They're all well supported. Uh, what we want to do is make this a API that manages our directory, and the directory, of course, is going to be a, bit, a, a Git version directory full of property files like this one. I'm going to clone this directory onto my local machine like so, okay, and we'll say cd desktop git clone 
to the config directory. It's just a bunch of property files. And so we're going to start this application up. Here we are. Good. And it's going to respond to requests from other microservices. So imagine you have a microservice called the reservation hyphen service. When it connects to the config server, it will see these two property files, reservation service.properties, which is only for that one microservice, and application.properties, which is for every microservice. There are two keys and values that we care about here. Server port equals 8,000, and we care about this message that says hello world. So let's go back to our reservation service here. Get rid of all that. We don't need it. We need to give our microservice now a name. So it's going to be called the reservation service. And it also needs to know where to find the config server, like this. You can say localhost 8080, and that would be fine. But this is the default value. So I'm only showing it to you now because I care. I'm a giver. But I may forget for the rest of the talk, and that's OK. This is going to work by default, unless you change the host and port. Okay? Now, let's use those keys and values. Let's connect our reservation service to the config service and tell it to grab the message that we said, the uh, hello world, right? So private final string value. And we're going to inject this in a constructor like so. So at value, OK, message. I'm going to create an endpoint here, at get mapping forward slash message string read. Return this dot value. Very good. So there's our, our REST controller, our microservice uh, that's going to use that REST controller. I can imagine wanting to change this later, though. So I'm going to make this bean at refresh scope so I can reload the configuration instead of having to restart the process every single time. Let's confirm that this has worked by going to port 8,000 reservations. That's working. And there's our message, hello world. That's working. Good. Let's change our configuration, though. I think this configuration value is good, but not great. So I'm going to use Emacs because I'm not a savage. Right? So I'll say Emacs reservation service dot properties. And we'll change this message to be something much better, not just the world, but Singapore. Right? So extra exclamation marks. OK. Git commit minus A minus M YOLO. Very good. So if we go to our config server, it sees the new value immediately. But our microservice has no idea. We need to tell it to redraw its configuration. And we can do this a few ways. The simplest is just to call the actuator endpoint called refresh. So you say localhost 8080 or uh, 8000 forward slash refresh. And I'm going to send a, an empty HTTP uh, post, right, like this. So before, I, before we actually do this, let's, let's line it up, right? So here we go. I've got the terminal on the left. I'm going to, make a, I'm going to hit enter, and then it's going to make a request of the actual web service on the right. And as soon as it can, it's going to refresh that one bean. And I'm not going to, you know, I'm going to try and beat it. I'm going to play this game that I always lose, like that terrible game Angry Birds. I'm going to play this game where I always lose. I'm going to try and beat the system to the browser to get it before it's refreshed it. OK. Oh, OK. One. Two, three. Bah, never mind. I lost a gain. So I hit enter, and as soon as I hit enter, I hit refresh on the browser, and the key was immediately visible. It didn't have to restart, didn't have to recompile, didn't have to redeploy. That's because of that refresh scope annotation here. This annotation tells Spring to recreate this one bean. This is great because now I can see that new value. I can get the message key re-injected from the config service. The config service is also, uh, I can secure every link in the communication from the config client to the config server and from the config server to the Git repository. All of that can be SSH or you know, certificate-based or HTTP-basic authentication. Uh, and I can also say to the client and to the, to the config server, if you have the same key, then you can do symmetric encryption and decryption. You can have s encrypted values in the property file that get decrypted on the client when they do a handshake. So I have a lot of power by introducing this config server. And it supports things like feature flags. And I can now deploy, I can now decouple the deployment of software from the release of that software. It makes it easy for me to you know, activate certain features or to keep them dormant in the code until it's time to turn them on from the business or whatever. Right? This is one useful feature. The next thing that becomes useful when you move to a distributed system is making it easy for one service to find and work with another. This is a very, very interesting use case, because in a dynamic cloud environment, things come and go all the time. They're not available all the time, right? They may go down uh, based on lack of need, and then they may scale up when there is more need. So we have to make it as easy as possible for one service to find and work with another service, even if that location changes, if this location of that service changes. DNS is kind of an OK option, but not really, right? In a dynamic cloud environment, there are several limitations for DNS. First of all, most cloud environments have public and private DNS, so it makes your code more complicated. Second of all, DNS is a very simple 
protocol. It knows where the service lives. It doesn't know if it's alive. Think about it as like, you know, you know where your friend lives, but you don't know if he's out, outside, you know, at, at the mall or something like that, right? He could be at home, but he could not be. I want to be able to ask the question, is that service there? If I make a request, will it block? Or will I get a response, right? If it's going to block, then I don't want to call. I want to do something else. I want to degrade gracefully. And another problem with DNS is that clients are pretty stupid about it, right? Java, for example, is now 21 years old. It's old enough to drink alcohol in the United States. Java caches DNS entries. So when it goes to a DNS server, it gets the, D gets the IP address from the DNS entry. It keeps that IP address, and then it calls that IP address again and again and again. It doesn't go to the DNS server again. So if you're using a DNS load balancer, you have just broken your, lo your load balancing. The first IP that you get will be unfairly dogpiled. It will be prioritized. Right? So these are bad behaviors. And you can, you can change all of this, but you have to know a lot about everything, and you have to care about all these things to get that result. So instead, we're going to use service registration and discovery. And there's a lot of good service registries out there. A service registry is a logical mapping from service ID to, uh, to the services IPs and all that stuff. But, um, and Spring Cloud provides an abstraction that you can use that makes it easy for you to talk to these different service registries. I happen to be a big fan of uh, Eureka. There's a lot, like I said, there's a lot of them that you could use, but Eureka is a nice fit for a couple reasons. Um, first of all, it's easy enough to get set it up and, and using, uh, usable for demo. And second of all, it's been used at scale uh, by one of the largest websites on the planet, so we know it works, right? Now again, this is just Eureka. I'm using Eureka, but you could also use, uh, you could use um, Apache Zookeeper, you could use HashiCorp Console, you could use uh, etcd, you could use Cloud Foundry itself. I mean, there's a lot of options here, right? But I'm going to set up a Eureka service, and we'll start that up. And that's going to start up on port 8761. OK. There we are. There's our registry. Now, there's a few things going on about this, a few things we should care about. First of all, very well done mouse over. That took a long time. We have doctors on the spring team. People are very, very smart. PhDs. They worked in nuclear physics. So it makes me very happy to imagine that someday, somewhere, somehow, there was a GitHub issue that said, damn it, we need good mouse overs. Look at that, huh? That took a year. Anyway, um, we have no applications registered yet either. No applications in the registry not available for consumption. So we need to go back and we need to teach our reservation service. We need to tell it to register itself with the registry. And this is possible because we have the discovery client abstraction in Spring Cloud, and that's supported by this implementation for Netflix Eureka. So all we need to do is to say, at enable, come on, <laughs> at enable discovery client, and then we start. So that's going to raise its hand. It's going to say, I'm here. If anybody needs me, find me here. This is my IP. This is my name. This is my uh, port, etc." And now we can build a client, something to talk to our service. And we're not just building a client for the, for the sake of building a client. We're building what's called an edge service, right? An edge service is the first part of call. It's the first uh, service that gets called when requests come in from the outside into your application. So we're going to use the web support. We're going to use REST repositories. We're going to use Lumbach. We're going to use Fane for declarative REST APIs. We're going to use Actuator for observability. We're going to use the Hystrix circuit breaker. We're going to use Zool for the microproxy support. We're going to use the... Uh, the uh, Zipkin distributed tracing and Eureka for service registration discovery and use the config client. And I think maybe for now, that might be enough. Maybe OAuth, you want to do OAuth? We don't, I'm not sure if we have enough time. We'll come back to it maybe. So we'll hit generate. And what we're going to do is we're going to build a client, as I say, that's going to be the first port of call for requests coming in from the outside world. And this is important because remember, in the world, there are all manner of different clients, right? Uh, all sorts of different ideas of clients, and if you have to change every single microservice, every time you add a new client to your system, you'll constantly be deploying and redeploying all of your microservices each time you add a new client. That's a, a non-starter, right? Even the most boring of organizations today support iPhone, Android, and HTML5. Guaranteed, right? That's the most boring, you can, least you can do today in 2017. Three different clients already. So you're building, you're very much in a client-centric world, right? Here in Singapore, your roads have IP addresses. They feed into a cloud. They, are, they use them for traffic shaping, right? For actual traffic shaping, not, not network traffic shaping, like car traffic. Your, your roads are clients to somebody's service, right? There are human beings walking around on the planet with organs, prosthetic organs or synthetic parts of their body that have IP addresses, right? So somebody's organ is a, is a client to somebody's service. 
you know, you've got PlayStations, your Rokus, your smart homes, your TVs, your smart TVs, your, you know, your uh, Xboxes, all these different things that have IP addresses, and they can be clients. HTML5 is a very common example. HTML5 browsers today are super powerful. They can do a lot of really cool things. But they run in a sandbox, and that sandbox makes it very hard for them to talk to other services on a different host and port, right? This is the si single origin policy, right? So what we want to do is we want to make it as easy as possible for HTML5 browsers to talk to other services. So we could add a uh, access control header to the downstream microservice, and the downstream microservice can say, I expect and, and accept requests from this particular URL and this URI, this host and port. I can do that, but I would have to change my service just to allow the HTML5 client. That's a non-starter. I, I don't want to deploy all my services again just because I added an HTML5 browser experience to my service, to my application, right? Instead, you can create a micro proxy. A proxy is just a nice way to, you know, proxy the requests inside and outside, uh, from the outside into the downstream services. And we can use Zool. Now, Zool, of course, uh, was created by Netflix. It's also from the first Ghostbusters movie. That's Zool. How many of you remember Ghostbusters? There is no Dana, only Zool, right? This is Zool the monster, he, he or she or it or whatever is a guardian, a gatekeeper to the underworld, to the inferno. It's a proxy to the underworld. Get it? It's a door. Never mind. It, it's fine. Give it time. Give it time. So there's that. And Zool works in conjunction with our Spring Cloud Discovery Client abstraction. So here are the services now. They're registered in the registry, reservation service on this IP, this service ID, and this port. And now I can use that service name as part of my proxy lookup. I can go to 99.99, and I can say, let's call the reservation service using this URL. It says localhost 99.99 reservation hyphen service forward slash reservations. This is the proxy URL. Here's the actual URL, right? So actual versus proxy. Actual 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 Actual proxy. You can see a few things that are different about this. First of all, the URLs have the service ID and the context path. That's how the client, the proxy, is making the decision about which node to call. Well, it knows which service to call anyway, but it doesn't know which node, does it? How does it know to call this instance instead of that one? There's no load balancing. There's no, there's no load balancer in play here, is there? The load balancing happens on the client, thanks to something called Netflix Ribbon. Netflix Ribbon is a client-side load balancer. So if you want to do more sophisticated kinds of load balancing, you can do LRU, or least recently used kinds of load balancing. You can do round robin or sticky sessions, of course. But what if you want to do you know, OAuth token aware load balancing? I have a token coming in from a client, and that token belongs to a user that has some sort of ongoing job that's running on this node. Where's the, where's the checkbox in your F5 that supports that? Right? There is no such thing. You need to write that code, and you can do that thanks to Netflix ribbon. The ribbon load balancer runs on the client. In this case, it's running on the proxy before the request is made to the downstream service. It goes to the service registry. It gets all of the service instances for a given service ID, and it passes the collection of service instances to Ribbon, which then says, you know, I choose you, like a Pokemon. Right? Then it, it finally makes the request, and it comes back all in the heartbeat, all in a very, very blink of an eye. So you get the request. The other thing you may have noticed is that the URLs are correct. The URL here is actually relative to the edge service, not, down, not to the uh, actual originating service. So the URL here, short, long, short, long. The origin service, the edge service, the proxy, is making a request to the downstream service, and it passes an origin URL in the headers. So the downstream service sees that, and it says, oh, I'm going to rewrite my URLs so that it looks like it came from that node. The browser client or the HTML5 device or whatever doesn't care, doesn't know that that service was actually generated or that response was generated in some other node. So OK, maybe this is enough. If I have homogeneous HTTP-based services, maybe I've got everything I need here. But a lot of times, I want to do more sophisticated things. I want to transform the payloads from one service to another. I want to translate them. I want to enrich them. I want to you know, uh, change the protocol, maybe. I want to go from HTTP to you know, Google protocol buffers or something like that, right? from JSON to Google protocol buffers. Whatever the use case is, this is, an, this is the right place to do that. So instead of just proxying data back and forth, Right? I could deploy my HTML5 browser device right now, the client, and it could talk to my Zool microproxy. That's fine. But instead of just proxying stuff back and forth, I want to actually transform the data from the downstream service and create a new synthesized view of the data. Maybe I want to have an endpoint that just has the names. So Josh and Weeran and Jade and so on. Just the names. We can discard the surrounding supporting 
JSON strata. We don't need that. We just want the names, right? So let's go here and create a new endpoint called the Reservation API Adapter REST Controller, right? And this is just going to be a controller that's going to live here at, at a forward slash reservations. And the endpoint will have an endpoint here. We'll have a, a git endpoint that returns just the name. So it'll be localhost 9999 uh, reservations forward slash uh, names. And it's just going to return a collection of strings, right? So I want to return a collection of strings. I could use the Spring Framework REST template, right? The, the REST template is a HTTP client that works very nicely with, uh, you know, web services. And this is a good choice, but the REST template doesn't know about our ribbon client-side load balancer. It doesn't know about our service registry, whether it's Eureka or Apache Zookeeper or whatever. So we need to tell it to, to do so, to be aware of that by uh, adding a load balancing interceptor. And if I did that, then I can say, well, I want to call that data REST template.exchange, HTTP reservation hyphen service, forward slash reservations, et cetera, et cetera, right? Make an HTTP git call, blah, blah, blah. That's certainly one option, but I think this is a little low level, right? I don't want to spend so much time writing code to manipulate HTTP payloads back and forth. That's going to make it expensive for me to, uh, to move data back and forth. It's going to make it cognitively expensive if I have to rewrite all of this HTTP marshaling back and forth. So instead, I want to move up a little bit. I want to move up the abstraction stack a little bit. I'm going to use something called Fane. Fane is a way to build declarative REST clients. Uh, it's from Netflix. It's um, a uh, you know it's based on the English word Fane. In English, Fane means to pretend. It means to act as. So if you see an animal in the forest, I know you don't have those here, but if you did, if you see an animal in the in the mall, and its head is backwards like this. And you can see its poor little heart, it's scared. It wants you to leave it alone. It's pretending to be dead. It's feigning dead. It's feigning death. It's not actually dead. It's just pretending to be so that you'll leave it alone. In the same way that WebSphere pretends to be useful, it feigns useful. It's not, it's not useful, of course not. It just wants you to leave it alone. It's scared, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create an endpoint that returns a collection of reservations in the envelope object. Remember the Hypermedia API that we created earlier? It's got a resource payload, a resource root, and that resource root has a payload of type reservation, and it has a collection of links. Well, I don't have this type here, do I? I don't have the resource, I don't have the reservation type on the class path here. So I could copy the one from the service. That would certainly be an option, but that would unnecessarily couple my uh, client to the implementation details on the service. And in particular, it would couple my client to the fact that the service is implemented with JPA. So I don't want to do that. I'll just create a client to DTO, but you can use things like, um, like uh, contracts, for example, to, to do the work instead. So here I'm saying call the reservation service, load balance the request across the different instances in the registry, and then pick, uh, use, whenever somebody makes a request to calling this method, make an HTTP git call to the reservations endpoint in the reservation service IP that we've gotten back there. And now I can rewrite this code. I can say, let's inject this reservation reader and use that to make the call. So read.gitcontent.stream.map. And all I'm going to do is I'm going to just map from the Hypermedia API to the payload, and then from the payload to the collection of links, capturing all that in the list. So there we go. There's my little client. I'll, take, I'll run that. And that will, that'll certainly work, I, I suppose. right? That'll certainly get us part of the way there. But it's not going to be great, is it? I mean, it's going to be, it'll do the 80% case, won't it? It'll do the 80% case, localhost, 99, 99 reservation names. There's, there's our names. That worked okay, but it's missing that 20% case. This is going to work fine if there are one or more instances of that service in the registry. What if there are zero instances in the registry? You can't load balance if there are no instances, right? That's like dividing by zero, and we all know what happens if you divide by zero, don't we? What is zero divided by zero? What is zero divided by zero? Oh, wait a minute. What is zero divided by zero? Imagine that you have zero cookies and you split them evenly among zero friends. How many cookies does each person get? See, it doesn't make sense. And Cookie Monster is sad that there are no cookies. And you are sad that you have no friends. 
It's true. Don't make Cookie Monster sad. Don't try to load balance by zero. It's just going to blow up in the client's face, and that's not a good experience, right? We don't want our iPhone users getting a big, fat Java stack trace in their client. In a sufficiently distributed system, services will fail. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. And it is our job to build systems that do the right thing in the case of that particular degradation. So in this case, I want to make sure that if something goes wrong in the pejorative sort of least common case, that we degrade gracefully. One way to do this is to use a circuit breaker. Gesund. So I can use a circuit breaker here, and I've got this on the class path. It's called a hystrix. The circuit breaker makes it simple for me to specify uh, fallback behaviors. So here's my, I'm going to say, whenever something goes wrong in this read method, call my fallback method here, public collection of string fallback, right? Return new array list. So I'm, all I'm doing is I'm returning an empty array list if something goes wrong. This is not uh, a, just a try-catch handler, though. This is much more intelligent. It's stateful. So if enough time, if enough requests come in and they all fail, that circuit breaker is going to see, oh, this is not working. It's just going to move the train tracks. It'll switch the train tracks to the fallback pathway. It's not going to call constantly that service that isn't responding. It'll eventually try again. It'll heal itself and let requests go through again. It'll try to. But if it keeps failing, it'll go back to the fallback method. Right? If you're using Cloud Foundry, right, if you have something like that, then Cloud Foundry will do the right thing. It'll make sure that when you call downstream service that isn't there, if the service falls down, it'll move heaven and earth all day and all night to restart that service. Right? It'll wear the proverbial pager. But it's our job as developers and architects to build a service that does the right thing in the face of that failure. This is what we're doing here. That circuit breaker degrades gracefully. It gives us this empty array list. Eventually, when we restart the reservation service, let's pretend we're cloud friendly right now. When we restart the reservation uh, service, it's going to re-register. It's going to start up. It's going to re-register with a registry. The registry is going to send a heartbeat event out to the clients. The clients are then going to invalidate their local cache perspective of the state of the service registry. And they'll see the updated entry for that reservation service in the list of services that are there. And it'll let requests go through. It'll heal itself. But it's our job to do the right thing here. We, we all know that if a web service is performing poorly, that the best thing that you can do is to refresh the browser a lot, right? <laughs> of course not. Same is true for your distributed system. We don't want to pound our, our, our web service when it's trying to come back online, do we? So this gives you that ability to, to degrade gracefully, to heal your services. And eventually, you know, after 30 seconds or so, this will come back online and everything will be fine. Now, we have our endpoint. We have our service. We've used that, circ that circuit breaker as a as a way to protect our downstream system. Uh, come on. Oh, Zipkin. That's not related. There we go. So there's our service. It came back online. You can set up the, you can reduce the threshold there from, to be much less, but I've got it set to the default. So now we've got that service. We've, got the, we've built a, a system that does the right thing in the face of failures for the read use case. For the write, of course, you should look at things like eventual consistency. You should use things like Spring Cloud Stream. This helps you build systems using messaging, like Apache Kafka or RabbitMQ, so that if you do a write and the downstream service isn't there, the broker can absorb it. And it makes it very simple to write this code without worrying too much about the plumbing of messaging code. Now, in this last sort of 10-minute stretch here, I want to focus on building a system and talking about observability, we saw in the very beginning of this talk that we looked at Actuator. We saw Actuator, and Actuator supports observing the state of a single service. But we haven't really talked about systemic visibility and observability. Remember, when I walk here in beautiful Singapore, is that the same thing if I'm walking on the streets, if I'm on Orchard Road, walking through all the malls? Is that the same thing as looking at the Google map? Can I, can I get the same feeling, the same effect? of looking at the Google map for Singapore as I can by actually being in Singapore? Isn't one much different than the other? I would say, of course, yes, it's much different. Being here in Singapore is far more alive, far, no, 10 more minutes. I started after five minutes after. So being here in Singapore is far more alive, far more vivid, far more interesting than, being, than looking at the Google map. You cannot appreciate one from the other. The map is not the terrain, right? And this is true for our distributed system. Our architecture diagram is not the same thing as our distributed system. We can only appreciate the, the distributed system by monitoring it, by being in production with the system. You can't just make assumptions about it by looking at the architecture diagram. There is emergent behavior that we need to capture. That circuit breaker is a nice place to start. 
that circuit breaker represents a connective tissue from one service to another. As we make a call, if that downstream service isn't there, our circuit breaker opens up, and that state is there, and we can monitor that state. Use it as a proxy for the downstream service. I am a very, very, you know, I'm a, a lifelong optimist. I'm a very happy guy. I know as an optimist, as an optimist that is very happy and has a lot of faith in humanity, I know that everybody will fail me all the time. And that they cannot be trusted to write code at all. They'll go off and do terrible things using MongoDB and PHP and they're going to expect me to talk to it. I know that humanity cannot be trusted at all. They're terrible, terrible people. That's the optimistic perspective. The, per the pessimist would say there's nothing that I can do about that. And I'm not a pessimist. I can protect my systems against their terrible, terrible, terrible life decisions. So that circuit breaker is one way to do that. If I cannot change their code, I cannot add my monitoring infrastructure to their systems, but I can monitor that circuit breaker. That circuit breaker is like monitoring their systems. And we can do that using the circuit breaker dashboard. Histrix dashboard. Config client Eureka Histrix dashboard. Histrix dash. No, come on. There we are. Good. Hit generate. Downloads. Unzip Histrix dashboard. CD Histrix dashboard idea palm.xml. Okay, and what we're going to do is we're going to monitor the state that's coming off those circuit breakers thanks to a stream that each circuit breaker gives off, right? So let's go to our code here and start this up. At enable Histrix dashboard, at enable discovery client. Okay, and we'll start that up. And what that's going to do is it's going to expect a server sent event heartbeat stream, a stream that it can use to visualize the flow of data through that circuit breaker. All right, let me uh, close that. Okay. This circuit breaker, localhost, reservation names. The circuit breaker goes on. Come on. Maybe I have to use Firefox. That's so disappointing. Okay. Now, well, the circuit breaker stream goes on and on and on and on and on forever and ever and ever, and ever. It is endless. It has no end. It is like the oceans, and the skies, and the stars, and the bugs in your code. Just infinite. <laughs> Just endless. And so, whatever you do, my friends, whatever you do, do not, and I cannot underscore this enough, do not curl this endpoint. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this endpoint here. Go to the lo I'm going to go to the circuit breaker dashboard, localhost, 8010histrix.html. I'll paste this value in, and I'll make some requests on the left. And as I make requests on the left, you can see the moving average trending ever upward on the right. It shows me that I've made 25, 31, 37 requests, that the circuit breaker is closed. But if I were to kill the downstream service, this would show me open. And I can see the moving average of flow through that circuit of requests through that circuit. And I can, of course, multiplex all of the circuit breaker dashboards into one, all the circuit breakers, rather, into one dashboard using Spring Cloud Turbine, right? This is all easy enough to do. This is one way to get that emergent behavior. Another is to use distributed tracing. And distributed tracing, in theory, is very simple. For every request that goes into the system, whether it's in the, uh, the Fane, whether it leaves via the Fane client or the REST template uh, or the, um, the uh, REST or RabbitMQ or, you know, uh, Apache Kafka, or if it's using, um, uh, the the uh, Zool microproxy, if it's using Spring MVC or the Spring Data REST endpoints, whatever the endpoint is, what, no matter how it comes and goes, for every service, for every request, for everything that happens, I want to make sure that I visit that request and I make sure that if there is not already a unique correlation ID present in the build, or sorry, in the request, that I then add that unique ID uh, so that it can be perpetuated later on, right? I want to be able to constantly uh, add that unique ID and if it's not there, I want to I add it. And if, it's not, if it is there, then I want to perpetuate it, right? So 
what I'm going to do here is I'm going to add one more dependency here because I forgot it on the uh, starter there. So zipkin server, good. And the zipkin server. Uh, so what, this, what we want in distributed, what we need to do in distributed tracing, is to make it easy, easy as possible to support that. And in theory, it sounds very simple, but in practice, it's very painful because you have to, for every place in the code that you have to do this, you have to remember to um, to uh, to add this handling logic, this generic interceptor logic. And so instead of doing that, we can use Spring Cloud Sleuth. Spring Cloud Sleuth is a distributed tracing abstraction, and it's already on our class path for the client. That's why you've seen those exceptions before, because it's trying to call to a service. I've got an implementation of Spring Cloud Sleuth called Spring Cloud Zipkin. Zipkin is a distributed tracing server from, uh, from Twitter. We were very lucky to have on the Spring Cloud team contributors and committers from, uh, from Twitter and from uh, Netflix, right? Let's see. Oh, whoops. Application.properties, spring zipkin hyphen service. Start. Okay. There's our distributed tracing server. It is. Okay, close this. Make some requests go, that go through both nodes. Go here. There we go. So as I make requests, you can see that it's aware of both the reservation client and the service, right? Make that a little larger. There's both of them there. I click on any one of them. And I hit Find Trace. It shows me the times, and I can see all of the requests that have been made into the system and their timings, right? And their relative timings. So I can see here's a waterfall graph that it, that I had a request that started the reservation client. It took so many milliseconds, then it went to the reservation service. The, re the request for the reservation, you know, in the reservation service, the processing lasted from here until here, so it took so many milliseconds. The total time was 32.1 milliseconds. If I click on any one of those nodes, I can see the request log, the in and out for each request, as well as the context for that request, the tags that I used to identify on which component handled the request, what information was present at the time, and so on. And you can add your own custom tags as well, your own custom context, things like the customer ID, the order ID, et cetera. This is very useful, but let's be very clear. This is not about warehousing and reporting. This is all about online telemetry. How much money did we make last quarter? I don't know. I don't care. But I can tell you what the average latency has been on the website for the last hour. Both the Hystrix dashboard and the Zipkin distributed tracing service support online telemetry. They're all about right now, present status. If you had to design a dashboard with three colors, blue, green, and red, what information would you use to decide what color to, to assign? It's that kind of information that we're assigning here right now. Should we worry? Is everything OK? Is something about to be wrong? This supports your ability to respond proactively and, if needed, be retroactively. Right? It helps you build support services that do the right thing. So today, my friends, we've looked ever so briefly at just a few things. We looked at how to build an application, a cloud-native Java system using Spring Boot and Spring Cloud that is agile. It's easy to change. It is robust in the face of service outages and topology changes. It is elastic. It takes advantage of the cloud. And it is observable, both at the system and the single node level. Right? I, I've talked about just a few things here, and I hope you liked some of this. Did you like any of this? Just show of hands. Curious. Very good. I appreciate that. I hope you got something out of it. I'm a big fan. I love spring. I'm a big fan. I have the spring t-shirt. I have the spring underwear. Of course, <laughs> of course I'm a fan. Of course I'm a fan. But you do not have to take my word for it. There are lots of interesting companies out there doing amazing things with the Pivotal stack, with Cloud Foundry, with Spring Boot, and Spring Cloud. There's a small company in the West that we've talked about a few times in this uh, discussion. Uh, they're called Netflix, and they are using Spring Boot and Spring Cloud at production scale. They've talked about it in their discussions, at keynotes, at conferences. They've been very proud about how they're using Spring Cloud, not just the individual components that they built. They're using Spring Cloud as a whole to reuse their own components. Imagine if you built an API or a library, and it used something from Apple, and then Apple's like, yeah, that's way better. We'll use your thing to use our own API than our own thing. That's what happened here. There's another company I, you know, here in the east, uh, here in the east, and just kind of up, up and a little bit further east. There's another small company called Baidu. They're a search engine in China. They serve 600 to 800 million people a day. They're using Cloud Foundry, Spring Boot, and Spring Cloud at production scale. Right? There's another company, another small company in China called Alibaba. They're uh, they're an e-commerce engine, and I believe that they're going to be big one day. <laughs> just give them time. They've only, they've only got a billion items in their catalog. I guess that's bigger than Amazon. But you know, one day, they could really become really big. They're using Spring Boot and Spring Cloud. And they've talked about it in conferences, magazine articles, co keynotes, and so on as well. There's another company even further east in Japan called Rakuten.com. 
They're, uh, they're, they're like, if, you know, if Amazon.com is the Alibaba of the far west, then Rakuten.com is the Alibaba of the far, far east, <laughs> right? And they're also using Cloud Foundry, Spring Boot, and Spring Cloud. Right? Yahoo Japan is using Cloud Foundry, for example, and I think they're starting to use Spring. The point is these organizations, and many others besides, banks, I, I, I'm here actually because I'm going to be talking to customers, banks here in, in Singapore, you know, financial services companies uh, of all stri stripes and shapes, and you know, insurance companies, media companies, all these startups in Silicon Valley, and these giant internet giants, all of them, if they need to solve these problems, they can do it. They have really smart people. Most of these organizations that I've just mentioned certainly have the money. They have the smart people. They have the necessity. They could solve these problems by themselves if they had to. But for them, and many others besides, they don't want to do that. They don't, they'd much rather use the Pivotal Stack because it helps them get to production faster. At the end of the day, that is all that matters. I want to thank you so much, Singapore. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, if you're here, uh, I want you to go to the Pivotal booth. We're hanging out there. I'll be there for a little while. We can talk. If you have questions, uh, I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Cheers. Sorry to have kept you for lunch. <laughs>